We begin with breaking news from Charlottesville, Virginia, where two people have been injured in an altercation with protesters who are out in force over the planned removal of a Confederate statue. Watch this. Hi, and welcome to Take a Walk on the Right Side, a podcast dedicated to understanding the key ideas, books, organizations, and individuals that comprise an increasingly transnational far-right-wing movement. Take a Walk on the Right Side hosts open and nuanced discussion between myself, Jesse Morton, once a jihadist propagandist, and Matt Heimbach, himself once a white nationalist and far-right-wing ideologue. Matt was considered by many to be the future face of white supremacy in the United States. Particularly after the disastrous 2017 Unite the Right rally, he co-organized in Charlottesville. Since then, however, Matt has departed the movement and has transitioned toward new understandings and beginnings. We seek to assist by providing a deeper, first-hand look at the threat the extreme right poses. We do so each week by analyzing the impact of key propaganda pieces. The impact they've had on creating a constantly mutating ideology and worldview that drives far right wing movements currently. By including our personal experiences in between, we aim to document similarities across the myriad ideological strands of extremism. At the same time, we hope to encourage others not to be deluded by the extremist mindset or recruiters and to leave if they are actively involved. Without further ado. So welcome back to another episode of Take a Walk on the Right Side with Matt Heimbach and Jesse Morton. We're here this week to discuss the second book in our series. This week we'll be covering Siege, which we mentioned a lot about in the past two previous episodes on the Turner Diaries. And in our coverage of the Turner Diaries, we discussed the Patriot sort of militia movement influence that the Turner Diaries had. And we also mentioned a lot the name James Mason who very different way understood the context and the historical unfoldings of the impact of the Turner Diaries in a light that created a sort of more extremist strand of neo-Nazism that, as Matt informed us last week, got a lot of resonance and a resurrection of sorts in the recent period. Uh, And he'll tell us about that today. So, but first, I'd like to welcome Matt, and I'd like to ask you, can you give us a little bit of a a background that includes a recap on Siege, what it is, where it came from, who wrote it, and a little bit of a historical context so that we can begin our discussion? Sure. Well, so our story today is that of Siege. And, you know, one thing that's to be understood in comparison to the Turner Diaries that we talked about and Hunter that we talked about in future books uh, most of these books, whether they're fiction or nonfiction, are usually you know, self-contained stories or narratives or a book like Mein Kampf, um, which is you know, part ideological, part autobiographical by Adolf Hitler. They're, they're very kind of self-contained stories, right? So, so Siege, however, is very distinct. Uh, of course, James Mason, we've talked about before, uh, he was involved from the time he was just a teenager, very, very young. Uh, he was in the youth movement of the original uh, American Nazi Party uh, under uh, Commander George Lincoln Rockwell. Uh, Commander Rockwell, of course, gets assassinated, and he continues on uh, being an activist in a variety of different organizations uh, throughout, you know, uh, the, I don't know, from the 1970s to the 1980s. But he writes a series of newsletters. That's what Siege essentially is. It's a collection of newsletters um, that were written on behalf of the National Socialist Liberation Front. And we talked about them before. Uh, one of the big things that made the National Socialist Liberation Front different is they rejected really engaging in politics at all. Of course, Commander George Lincoln Rockwell, he was famous for things like running for governor, uh, protesting integration. He was very, very involved in political stunts. He came from a, a family of vaudeville performers. He was, uh, whether you you love him, you hate him, you have no opinion, uh, he was very, very good in getting those kind of viral moments, uh, you know, 50 years before <laughs> the uh, the use of that word would become popular, uh, understanding kind of showmanship um, and show business of being flashy. That's the reason why the original American Nazi party, uh, why they wore the brown shirts. That's why they wore the swastikas. That's why they uh, actually called themselves the American Nazi party, because the American Nazi party is uh, very over the top. And Commander Rockwell thought, uh, and rather accurately, that that would be so outrageous, that would be so over the top in an age before the internet. And, you know, you can print off as many leaflets as you want, but you can only hand them out to so many people. If you wanted to punch through uh, really kind of the blackout of 
of um, you know the 1960s and 70s culture, you had to get media attention. So he was very good at stunts um, and, and very much engaged in politics, like I said, including running for elected office himself. Um, the National Socialist Liberation Front was a complete break from that. And this goes into what we've been discussing in terms of the inspiration for Charles Manson and modern organizations like the Adam Waffen Division and others in the base um, that are anti-political. They have no interest in stunts. They have no interest in getting on the six o'clock news. They do not want to run people for political candidacy. The National Socialist Liberation Front, of which James Mason was a big part of, and that was a huge inspiration for his later work, uh, rejected politics almost entirely. It, it was viewing itself far more in the framework of the 1960s radicals, uh, whether it was anti-war radicals or the, the growing you know, environmental movement or uh, black separatists, the, uh, the revolutionary fervor that I guess kind of culminated in the, uh, the 68 uh, Democratic Convention and, and things like that. This was the spirit where the National Socialist Liberation Front comes from. So Mason essentially writes the newsletter. Um, so this long collection, uh, he, he writes for, uh, for multiple years until uh, 1986. So he gets involved in the National Socialist Liberation Front uh, and, and the ANP when he, in the, the late 1960s. So we're talking a very long period of time. And he is writing this, uh, this newsletter that becomes a collection which we now know as Siege. So it's, you know, the, the, one of the things about Siege is that it, it's not really a necessarily coherent insofar it goes from a point A to a point B to explain ideology, a story. It's really, in a certain way, kind of a snapshot of the movement and the thinking of the people that had rejected politics within white nationalism at the time. Um, so, so it's a bit disjointed. It's very long. It's over 400 pages. And it basically boils down to, to a series of, well, a long series of articles that discusses kind of political tactics, where things are going to go. And the, the spirit of revolution is what really motivates that. Not trying to save America, not trying to reframe things, not trying to move the ball down the field, but to fundamentally tear the system down to be able to rebuild something. Uh, you know, he talks about in, in one of his articles, uh, the National Socialist Liberation Front, One Man Army. Uh, and I think it's a, a, a pretty well-written article, to be honest. And, and what he says in that is, let us instead fully enjoin the concept of the one man army and not to pull a total Tarantino, but um, when we see the individual attacks that are happening nowadays and people are wondering about that, uh, remember, remember this phrase, uh, the concept of the one man army and bring the struggle to the enemy, wherever you may be at the moment, let the revolution be there also spread a little revolution wherever you go, never gripe about the system, project the revolution. Get the people around you thinking in terms of totality and not in terms of inches and degrees. Point out the real enemy and not just the noisy, obnoxious symptoms. Tell everyone it is the system itself that must go. Convey the feeling that it will be good to have all true white men and women as comrades in arms in the revolution. Don't try to promulgate a faith. There's already too much of that. Be a spark for revolution. Don't be a harbinger of doom. Be a carrier of revolution. And we see this spread a lot throughout um, of, of the book and these newsletter, newsletters in general. They're usually pretty punchy, shorter articles, but the concept of revolution and how you as an individual can be a one-man army. That to tear down the system, you do not need a large dues-funded organization that is doing what Commander Rockwell was doing or a lot of other organizations, whether it's the, the Ku Klux Klan or the White Citizens Council, whatever. Um, the opposite of that, that instead of trying to get mass support and try, and instead of trying to get bills passed and things like that, you are a one-man army and revolution. You are to be a Johnny Appleseed of revolution wherever you go. And this is a huge ideological break from anything we have seen in the American movement prior. And I think is ideologically distinct going forward, but it explains what's been going on in recent years in terms of the uptick of individuals being their own one man army and, uh, and, and going out and committing violent acts. So this, this inspiration really only comes from one place amongst the American movement. Uh, it's not from the Klan. It's not from the skinhead movement. It's not from Dr. Pierce. It's not from Pastor Butler. Uh, it's not from, from any of these other really organizations. The ideological framework of the, of the one-man army, the political soldier, the revolutionary who is behind enemy lines, has to tear the system down 
really comes from James Mason. And uh, without understanding him and Siege in general, you really can't understand what's going on today. You just kind of end up lumping everyone together. And I think that's a grave intellectual disservice to society at large. Agreed. And thank you for that background. That was excellent. Stemming from there, let us dissect a little bit of what we talked about last week. Last week, you referred to the Mason, Mansonite, sort of jihadi neo-Nazi sector. And I think that that encapsulates not only just the progression of Siege as an ideological uh, role player in the uh, formation of the modern, more extremist one-man army approach or leaderless resistance model, but tell us about James Mason's relationship in a bit more detail than we had an opportunity to go into last time with regard to Charles Manson and the Manson family and how that manifested itself as a sort of archetypal ideology that really was certainly influential on platforms like Iron March, but then especially when Adam Waffen adopted Mason as like its, its godfather figure. Can you take, a, take us through a little bit about how that distinction and how that acceptance of Charles Manson, how did Mason and Manson interact? Why was that important? Sure. Well, of course, um, you know, as I mentioned previously, uh, a big inspiration is Joseph Tomasi. Um, of course, he is, he is killed, you know, young, younger than I am now, and the founder of the National Socialist Liberation Front. So there, there seems to be, there's kind of a, a loss of a, of, of a bedrock, a loss of a center when Tomasi is killed. Well, I mean, which we see repeated throughout history, uh, the American Nazi Party, of course, uh, fundamentally uh, falls apart without Commander George Lincoln Rockwell, just like the National Alliance falls apart uh, without Dr. Pierce, the Aryan Nations falls apart without um, Pastor Butler, and, and so on and so forth. So Mason has never been a particularly charismatic individual. He's not so much like a leader of men. He's always really been kind of this this sort of thinker. But going back into the early 1980s, he reaches out to former members of what we know as the Manson family. Um, he starts he starts writing and communicating, and apparently, uh, ba based on a couple different reports I read, because I always like to fact check, um, in, in 1982, uh, Mason actually, when he founds the Universal Order, it's with the, the consent and the input of Charles Manson. So as there there's this really this big vacuum in terms of... Uh, the movement and this ideological revolutionary sort of perspective, most of the movement continues on as it always has been. I mean, that's when you have Klansmen marching in, you know, Pulaski, Tennessee every year uh, with American flags and things like that. I mean, kind of kind of the status quo, the beginning, the growth of the militia movement that we covered uh, pretty extensively, uh, survivalists, uh, Christian identity churches that are popping up and kind of communes you know, doing doing their own thing. Uh, there, there's this, this big vacuum for this revolutionary perspective. So Mason begins reaching out um, to individuals of the Manson family, uh, culminating in communication directly with Charles Manson, who of course is in prison. And a lot of this, you know, the, his sort of perspective and information really kind of comes together. And, and th th this is really brought together, I think, uh, there, there's one of the articles in, in Siege, which is revolution equals family. And one of the big things that, that, that's really kind of important is, uh, you know, again, we've, we talked about the vision of Charles Manson to have the family, to cause a racial conflict, a race war, to hide, let the system destroy itself, and then come out and, and be on top. And, and Mason writes in the book, in this article, it can mean living underground, but it'll be more commonly mean living in a state of gradually moving further toward the underground, holding off Big Brother wherever possible, ripping off Big Brother, Big Brother wherever possible, dropping out of the slave market first, working toward dropping out of the system entirely, discarding the dead and false values and morality of the rest of the slaves, and doing only what you have to do in order to survive. It means raising a generation of children who are conscious of their race and conscious of the evil that dominates the mainstream of life. It means giving these children true values and real purpose, the things that they will need when the full-scale war takes place and about the time that they are reaching adulthood. The best long-range goal the strategy can have is our successfully existing, not as atoms, but as effective units, then tribes, communities, and finally again as a nation. This biological bond must live and build. It must survive while all forms of the system and government are diminished and blasted away. So what's that is essentially saying is this is the ideology 
that Charles Manson put forth. This was his plan back in the 1960s. So as Mason is talking with Manson, he is talking with members of the Manson family and is getting this input, it's going directly into his newsletters in the late 1970s up till the mid 1980s. Like, and you know, the usage of uh, phrases just in this article, uh, pigs of the system, right? Um, you know, in, in one of the, uh, the murders that were attributed to the Manson family, um, you know, writing messages on the walls, pigs and stuff like that. Th this sort of rhetoric uh, comes back 15, you know, 20 years later in the writings of James Mason to inspire him. So fast forward doo -doo -doo, um, <laughs> to the, uh, the semi-modern era when, when people are discovering essentially uh, James Mason, who has lived in obscurity since the mid 1980s, uh, this book, Siege, begins to speak to them in, in a really meaningful way on, on platforms such as Iron March, because fundamentally, if they, they are, the, these individuals are once again rejecting uh, the idea of a political solution. They're, they're rejecting. Back to what Iron March is, I don't mean to cut you off, but oh, yeah. for those that haven't heard the last episode. Oh, yeah. Well, first of all, they should go back and listen to the episode. So that's <laughs> shame, shame on them for not doing. Uh, but Iron March was a, um, a, a, forum essentially that was established in the early 2010s and by by a russian actually and it was a global network essentially of of fascists that was that was the principle and the discussions of this idea and then this is where these individuals kind of dig james mason's writings up which had not been a part of the movement discussion or ideology for for decades, even in the mid 1980s, like I, I believe today that James Mason and Siege have far more relevance today than they did at, at Mason's heyday being involved in politics in the 1970s and 80s. Um, so in, in terms of Iron March, these, these young teenagers mostly um, are getting together, discussing ideas. And one of the big ideas that they, they strike on is, uh, is Siege. It, it becomes a, an ongoing meme. Uh, you know, read Siege, you know, have you read Siege? Like, doesn't even sound like you've read Siege. Like, you would see that in comment threads uh, outside of Iron March constantly as they were going out as these uh, Johnny Appleseeds of revolution to to spread the message of James Mason and to kind of build this this family. I mean, again, this, this concept of a family to dig in with these principles, provoke the system in which the system will tear itself to pieces, and then the, from the ruins, like a phoenix, these individuals will rise up and, you know, in, in networks, create a, a new society, essentially. So um, Iron March breathes uh, fresh life into Siege, and amongst it, we see the formation of a, a large number of organizations, Adam Waffen, National Action, and others, that um, really uh, brings this message into uh, the modern era. And so the distinction being that the synthesis between Mason and Manson pretty much fell flat. It disappeared, became really unimportant. And all of a sudden it gets its resurrection is the ability for Siege to get a resurrection because it's a well-written collection of works? Or is it that, in a sense, maybe Mason saw something coming with regard to the declination of culture and society? And maybe that synthesis made it all the more resonant and all the more powerful. Agree or disagree? Well, I mean, one of the things, like one of the articles um, too in, in Siege is called Strike Hard, Strike Deep. Um, and I think it's important because because this is this whole distinction we've been talking about. Uh, just the first uh, paragraph and a half says, I am compelled at this time to add my voice to those few who have demanded that such things as phase one activities must stop. Simply such nonsense as trying to make headlines, confront the enemy, or rally the white masses won't work, never has worked, and almost always results in merely revealing our weaknesses and making us look like idiots. The very strategy calls itself for numbers, which we do not have at this time. My view is that just because the Jews and liberals have succeeded in making goyim out of the vast majority of whites, we need not sacrifice ourselves in a vain attempt at proving them wrong. We have got to trash can 1933 strategy and tactics. They won't work. Mm -hmm. For a decent street demonstration, you have to have anywhere from 50 to 100 uniformed and disciplined troopers. We have managed 50 on several occasions and 100 on only one occasion. For the rest, it is pitiful and ineffectual, futile, counterproductive, and I might add costly and dangerous. As much as I hate to see a good comrade wounded in such a useless action, I hate worse to see the sacrifice of millions of lives in World War II that went into building the terrific reputation that we have enjoyed and are now wasting. 
Um, and, and okay, so this is, I, I think, one of the you know the, the, the really big points where Mason sees, uh, I really think, that the the Rockwellian tactics that he he got his start in, his original inspiration in, were falling flat by the mid 1980s. Um, that they had, I mean, really, I mean, what what he's saying is essentially, you know, if you were to fast forward that events like Charlottesville, uh, events like, demonstra- I mean, I've done demonstrations from coast to coast uh, in other countries, all that stuff. And and fundamentally, he's rejecting any principle of having a mass movement, right? He's saying it won't work. Um, the, the strategy of 1933 is, of course, uh, discussing the rise of the National Socialist um, German Workers' Party and the idea of the, the mass marches and, and things like that. The electoral strategy fundamentally will not work. Um, There's not enough people. The risk of doxing, of physical violence, of arrest, of lawsuits, these things like that. Uh, He's calling in the 80s that it's it's not going to work. It's worth more trouble than it's worth. And, um, you know, that going forward is really like post Charlottesville, but even before that, with with the political wing of uh, of the movement, uh, they reject anything. Like there, there, to my knowledge, were were no substantial amounts of like Adam Waffen division or other people um, at Charlottesville, or they they wouldn't come to other demonstrations and things like that because of this rejection of any sort of electoral politics or building a mass movement. So it's it's all about getting a small number of fanatics that can be able to resist and tear down the system wherever they can. Uh, and, and this is really what separates them in a lot of ways from, from everyone else. The, the idea of you, you don't waste your time trying to recruit people, um, trying to inspire people, trying to speak out a message, get yourself on the television to say, you know, you're 30 seconds before you get butchered uh, in editing. Uh, it, it's an entirely different perspective that's really a, a dropout fight back sort of thing. And uh, it's, you know, it, it, it's, it's played out into the, the grander wide, you know, wide strategy. Very good. And so how much reading of Siege? Uh, I know that, you know, the way that I see Iron March is very akin to when jihadism was trying to find its own narrative in a Western audience. There were forums that were discussion threads, just like Iron March, where it made... Uh, for the opportunity for a much more sophisticated dialogue and discourse and to root out sort of core ideas and to have, you know, heightened conversation. And then the shift into platforms like Facebook and Twitter and things of that nature doesn't necessarily facilitate that. But I think of it in the same way that when jihadism had to figure out the deeper conceptual questions of, for example, whether or not it was better to go kill a civilian on the street or to go travel abroad and whether it was permissible to do so and all of these sort of divisions and metastasizations occurred in a previous era about, you know, we'll say seven years before we have uh, the same thing, I think, occur on on Iron March. But a lot of those uh, discussion forum threads that were held on Iron March show a lot of ignorance, a lot of simplistic conversations, but they also show a bit of sophisticated blending and opportunity to sort of synthesize a lot of fascist doctrine and uh, fascist influencers, but Siege really becomes influential from amongst groups like National Action and particularly Adam Waffen. Um, how much reading of Siege occurred in those years uh, in order to get you know the young kids that went on to establish Adam Waffen in what, 2017 or whatnot, you know, how much reading of Siege actually occurs or is it just more a reference point where these individuals that are in this neo-fascist milieu don't necessarily have much contact with the actual writing of the book. They just know the book. They know its basic argument and they sort of adopt it and run with it. Or how much is it really impacted the uh, intellectual or cognitive strand of the people that we might consider to be the leaders of the movement, despite the fact that they probably were 19 or 20 uh, (laughs) at the time of considering themselves dabbling with uh, intellectual issues like this one. Oh, no. I, I mean, Iron March was incredibly intellectual. Uh, I mean, for all the jokes and the memes and the, the idle conversations on physical fitness or, you know, oh, well, I, my dog died or, you know, and things like that. I mean, there, there was a fraternity and a brotherhood for sure, uh, but far more ideological um, than I would say basically all of the previous several decades of the movement, potentially like ever. 
uh, honestly. I, I mean, you know, you, for instance, you read like George Lincoln Rockwell's uh, White Power uh, or This Time the World. Uh, those are books that are, are very easy to read. Um, they're very simplistic in a lot of their ideas. I mean, you know, and, and White Power, um, which I guess we could, we could probably cover in one of our episodes. Uh, you know, they're, they're probably one of the most famous passages where you imagine uh, that you're a, you know, a Joe Sixpack white guy and you wake up and uh, the race, the race war has begun. And, uh, you know, there's black mobs everywhere. And then you hear tanks roll up and the soldiers are here, but oh no, they're black soldiers. And, you know, your family is, is murdered and stuff like that. Like it's, it's very kind of like over, over the top simplistic and, and, and a propaganda uh, level that, that was not geared towards any sort of like deep thinking um, in, in any sort of like philosophical way. Uh, versus, well, Siege and the things that come along with it uh, really had a lot more to it. So, no, Iron March, I mean, I argued, just personally, from my own experience, I argued with people. I argued on Iron March. Um, I argued with people uh, from Adam Wolf and other groups off uh, on different platforms like Facebook and Twitter and stuff like that back when I could have those uh, <laughs> the, 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 those uh, wonderful, uh, wonderful ways of communicating with the world. Um, but, no, like... They were incredibly well read. Uh, I mean, you, you go ahead and you put your average like seventeen year old you know shit poster for for I don't know what else you want to call them um, on Iron March. They've probably read more than most of the quote unquote experts mm -hmm. in the, you know studying you know the far right and stuff like that. They they have read the obscure books. They I mean they had guys that were going ahead like if they were Hungarian or Romanian, you know, uh, guys that were Romanian were translating, um, you know, original copies that they'd found, you know, from their grandfather or something of newsletters that the Legion of St. Michael, the Archangel or the Iron Guard uh, put out Hungarians that uh, were translating things from the Arrow party and, and things like that. I mean, creating resources that didn't exist. And because of the, the ability of the internet, you're able to exchange these ideas. I mean, if you were a white nationalist in America in like the 1980s, I mean, what, you could read like a Klan newsletter or you could you could read Rockwell's White Power. Uh, you could read a, a translation of Mein Kampf, uh, maybe, you know, but uh, there really wasn't, and hasn't been for a very long time, a strong intellectual tradition. American white nationalism and, and white supremacy, I mean, looking back at the 1960s, especially like white supremacy, is is inherently reactionary without a lot of intellect. Uh, you know, like we're organizing in this Klan chapter in 1960 to oppose black people coming to our school, right? There, there's not a whole lot of, of deep philosophical uh, notions. No one's discussing Nietzsche. No one's discussing the, uh, you know, the Aryan spirit and uh, the Kali Yuga and things like that. Uh, with the exception of maybe like Francis Parker Yockey's uh, Imperium, in the post-war period, the the American movement is very intellectually devoid, I would say. So Iron March, totally different, totally different. It was a pleasure um, just, you know, because so many times you end up arguing with people in the movement that um, were just not, not well-read, didn't have very formed ideas. And even if you, you know, in my experience, going up and arguing against uh, Charles Manson's plans and stuff like that. It was so nice to have you know, be arguing with people that had read books that were that were incredibly well read and well versed, uh, that were encouraged to read materials from uh, across the political spectrum. And of course, Siege is kind of uh, the beating heart of this to to guide all the other actions and the, the sorts of organizations that would come from them. Uh, but for anyone to brush off uh, Adam Waffen or, or Iron March or anything like that as just like reactionary or it was a joke or these kids were full of hate. And I mean, maybe some of them were, you know, I mean, lots of bad stuff has come from them. So, you know, but but to to distill it into a cartoon character sort of portrayal, uh, which I really think dominates the American media narrative. And, and a lot of experts, um, you know, when they put things out, the Iron March was incredibly well read um, with reading Siege as a mandatory part and being able to discuss it, being able to not just get the broad concepts and the Sparknotes version, but to really dig in and then go from there in a variety of, of different packages. And with the lens of Siege, however, um, you know, I mean, James Mason like is well you know i, I don't know I, I i heard personally that uh as of late uh, he had had a conversion to christianity which might have changed his perspective but looking back towards his reigns in the 1960s or, or 70s and 80s and such and, and onward um definitely in that white supremacist camp like not a not a not a white nationalist that believes in the equality of all their peoples 
uh, a white supremacist that wants to kind of, you know, dominate the sort of world. Um, and, and then you compare that with writings of like Savitri Devi, who I think we're going to dig into in another episode, uh, who of course was a Hindu national socialist that speaks very often about the, the equality of humanity as, as each ethnicity, each nation uh, is a, a different type of flower in a garden. And while they are separate, uh, they are beautiful together. And that, that's what makes the garden, right? Um, big ideological distinction from other post-war national socialists uh, like Leon de Grel, who was a, an SS general that spoke often about the fact that, you know, for instance, like Arabic troops uh, that were Muslims in the SS uh, were, were equals and uh, talking about how national socialism wasn't against any other race. Mason's view of, of white supremacy is what colors the interpretation of pre and post-war fascism and how it's applied in the rhetoric behavior, even even the propaganda styles for leaflets and stuff like that, which is very distinct from a lot of the other post-war movements. So yeah, no, Iron March was incredibly well read mm -hmm. in my experience. I mean, there's there, there's dullards, I'm sure, on you know, in every political spectrum on any website or any group, whatever. But on average, far better read, far better educated, at least in terms of these things, um, than most people in the movement in general, uh, probably in most of the American movement for decades. Uh, but everything was seen through the lens of siege. So there, there was no arguing. I mean, I know I had plenty of arguments about um, being opposed to white supremacy and how that fits within national socialist thinking. But them coming from the perspective of James Mason, uh, they would argue against that. So everything was was really put through, you know, your your Mason colored lenses. Very good. Thank you for that. And, and I'm going to stay in that historical vein just a little bit. Um, Iron March runs and is popular from 2015 till 2017 ish. Really, it is a space where even if everyone in that environment is not necessarily at a uh, intellectual aptitude to understand the, dis the discourses and the discussions that are being held on the forum, it is a space where those that know the ideology the most from around the world are kicking ideas off of each other. And what you get from that is very interesting because in historical context of 2014, 2015, 2016, of course you have the ongoing Syrian war, the concern with refugees, which in turn is uh, allowing, you know, far right ideologies to resonate throughout Europe. And from that you have, you know, influences from Iron March, you know, national action in particular, I think is, is very important with regard to being able to create a more extremist, more neo-Nazi, neo-fascist aligned component of groups like EDL and Britain First and things of that nature. You have the Azov Battalion who, uh, you know, is was influenced to some degree by the conversations that were had on Iron March, groups like Nordic Resistance Movement. And then you have the Americanized sort of interpretation of those intellectual discussions by the adoption of the group Adam Waffen. And Adam Waffen is pretty, particularly interesting because they really do essentially, I think, for the general public's eye at least, take those conversations that are held on Iron March. And what essentially happens when you allow ideas to be conveyed amongst people that are what you might be consider might consider to be the hubs of a network, and this is sort of a nascent developing network during these periods. These are young people adopting these views, but they're going on to want to do things like create groups, organizations, and movements in their own country. But there's this sort of synthesis of thinking, and there's this, this absorption of an ideology. And so by the time Charlottesville rolls around, you have the siege pillars going against the red pillars and they start the, 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 the whole siege culture phenomenon. It got to the point where now there was this sort of fringe idea that could compete with the alt-rights, you know, red pill for none of that stuff is going to work. And then as we discussed in the first, second and third episodes, Charlottesville United Right comes and it looks like everything that they said was true. And so I guess you could say that the siege pill took over for the bread pill. Can you tell us how siege and its impact on Iron March manifests itself in the United States in particularly? A little bit more about Adam Waffen's adoption of siege as a core cornerstone of its propaganda. Well, I mean, you know, one of the things also, uh, you know, you'd brought up uh, the the killing of uh, two Adam Waffen members um, down in Florida. And and of course, one thing that's interesting, of course, with, with Iron March and, and kind of siege in general, um, one thing that, that is important, I mean, we often discuss uh, kind of some, some similarities between uh, radical Islamic extremism 
and um, and what we're talking about here. And um, you know, of course, it was a member of Adam Waffen who had converted uh, to become an Islamic extremist that he ends up uh, turning a gun and killing two of his roommates. Um, that 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 was the reason he did it. Like he for mocking he, him for becoming a, a Muslim. Yes, right. Yeah, but, uh, but but you know, in terms of a lot of the propaganda um, that you can see coming from uh, news, uh, which was their their zine, their online newsletter. And things like that. Uh, I mean, you would often see pictures of, uh, you know, Taliban fighters or Al Qaeda fighters and things like that. Uh, one that I can remember off the top of my head uh, said like the Islamic example and things like mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that that was definitely a, a big I inspiration. And you know, seeing again this this concept of you know, it, it wasn't even so much about whiteness. It was more about being anti-system. And you know, if Al Qaeda is fighting the great and the little Satan. Uh, then of course, then then they are our allies, and that we should model ourselves off them because they've been incredibly successful. Uh, they've been successful in striking back against uh, the American regime, and you know the, this model has survived. You know torture and uh, murder, and you know kidnapping of members. I mean, you know, all the sorts of things the American Empire has done, right? So so that that definitely was a piece of inspiration um, that that I think kind of gets brushed under the rug a little bit but um yeah in terms of like the siege pill versus the red pill yeah no like 2017 like they you know as i've said before like they they win the argument fundamentally right. um because if you can't run a political organization and go to a permitted rally that with the permits upheld by a federal judge in the aclu and um then you basically get sued out of existence or your guys get arrested for defending themselves and stuff like that uh, and the, the media presentation is, uh, you know, the, the minds are made up around the, the country uh, before any any facts have been done. We have a very uh, viral clickbaity sort of media. I don't think anyone's going to be offended by me saying that. And, um, you know, that that really does set the stage for the Adam Waffen guys following the model of siege, going back and saying, you know, here here in 1985, James Mason said this, you know, you dummies, like, you, you didn't you read Siege? It said right here, you can't hold a public demonstration without getting a, guy, a bunch of guys arrested, getting sued, um, being mocked in the media where no one hears your message. The courts will turn against you like we told you this, you know, we told you this, you know, 20 years before we were born, <laughs> you know, sort of thing. And um, that set the stage for the foundation of, you know, splinter groups like the base and others, where I think it's going to be one of the fundamentally dominant political forces uh, in terms of uh, the white national, well, you know, again, like I think they, they fall very heavily into the white supremacist uh, tradition versus, you know, again, I always like to say this, uh, some white nationalists are white supremacists, um, but not all white nationalists are white supremacists. Um, th th these are different ideologies uh, in a lot of different ways. But um, I think amongst uh, a, a certain vein, especially amongst, you know, young men, uh, that don't feel that they can engage the system, but are angry and some have legitimate grievances. Others are dealing with mental illness. Uh, one of the members of Adam Waffen that's alleged to uh, to have killed a gay Jewish man uh, was struggling with his own sexuality and, and might have been gay. And part of him being an Adam Waffen, he went and he, he killed a guy. I mean, he allegedly flat out murdered him in a park. Um, and there's a, a whole lot we could dig into that about the the you know in, internal dialogue and creating culture and family uh, within a group. So you've got to live up to these certain standards, but having your questions about yourself and then it turning into rage and then that costing someone their life. You know, I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of complexity uh, in all of this. But um, I really think going forward, while there isn't a, a space for there to be a platform of ideas for people that are upset about mass immigration, low wages, uh, changes in, in culture and things like that, that uh, a certain percentage are going to say, look, we can engage the system. They're going to take the siege pill instead of the red pill, you know, instead of making Disney music parodies on YouTube or writing articles, a certain percentage are going to say the only thing we can do is, you know, we can't just drop out because as we had talked about in our, our Patriot episode, uh, Randy Weaver uh, and the Branch Davidians at, at Waco, they uh, they respectively in their two separate states tried to drop out of the system, uh, but you know the system came to them and uh, and murdered innocent people, and I don't think anyone can question that. So you know if you can't drop out, you can't just hide, you can't build your own community in their eyes, then uh, a certain percentage are going to be inspired by this message and are going to lash out, and you can be that one man army, that political soldier, and th this is going to stick with us for a long time, and. 
all the deplatforming, I think, has, has fundamentally made this problem a lot worse because what is the counterbalance to what these guys are saying? To say, no, we can engage the system, that we as a society can discuss ideas, even if we disagree and we can find compromises. If uh, one section of the population is totally shut out from being able to, to voice their opinions and engage politics, then you know it, it makes sense that it seems like a growing number of people in, in underground networks are uh, going to say, well, look, we might as well we might as well start tearing down the system, following the examples uh, put forward by James Mason Siege. And it's it's going to cost us a lot. Uh, people can feel really clever and proud of themselves that they're, quote unquote, deplatforming hate. But uh, the long lasting impact, I think, is going to be uh, really bad uh, and it's going to continue for a long time. What was very fascinating for an objective observer looking outside of the chatter that would be considered far right in general, uh, not just at Charlottesville and Unite the Right, but even for a year or so after that, was that there was much more conversation about the red pill than there was about the siege pill. And then at one point over the course of the previous period, there was an inability to argue for the siege pill in a way that would get any sort of traction with that community um, per se. Um, all of a sudden, there was just a groundswell of like, yeah, 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 the red pill is junk. Siege pill, siege pill, siege pill. And it w began to be everywhere. And then when Christchurch happened, I think Christchurch is like the ultimate manifestation of the conquering of the accelerationists over the traditional white nationalist, white supremacists, as you demarcated for us in the first episode. It seemed almost like the Christchurch killing in the manifesto that was left behind really kind of cemented a victory for that siege pill. And that's where we've seen since that act, not only an increase in violence, but an increase in law enforcement and the general public's efforts to sort of address, but not just to address, really to understand where this comes from. But certainly the siege pill wins. And now we have a phenomenon where a large portion of those followers that were Adam Waffen, that were really primarily responsible for pushing the siege pill narrative, have been either arrested or they've essentially disbanded. But I think the tactic of siege pilled essentially now is being referred to as accelerationism and it's been blurred the principle still exists but do you see much or do you know of seeing much of reference to siege in the contemporary era or has the idea itself come to sort of predominate but not necessarily any longer due largely to the disbanding of Adam, Adam Waffen. Do you think that that will be real and that, that that will end references to the siege but that it might not necessarily uh, require a referencing to the siege going forward. Well, again, I think we're going to have, um, you know, there, there's currently really two strands in American white nationalism of uh, politically minded individuals, the American nationalists, uh, which can really be summed up uh, sort of as a, as a classist institution through like the, the Richard Spencer's, the Jared Taylor's identity Europa, which is now um, the American identity movement and to a lesser extent, a uh, Patriot front. Uh, and then you've got the you know, increasingly third positionist, uh, larger amounts of, of national Bolsheviks, and um, you know, I mean, really more more left leaning, politically minded individuals in the uh, the quote unquote Whig Nat camp, um, which you know are are separate, uh, you know, obviously being politically minded than this. But um, no, I mean, the, the siege pill is still here. I mean, the fact that, you know, Adam, after Adam Waffen, essentially, before they were disbanded, they, uh, they had gone defunct after, you know, the, their, their founder uh, was imprisoned, uh, two of their comrades were killed, another one converted to become a jihadist, um, you know, the, the murder of a, of a young gay Jewish man by another member, uh, and then later an alleged murder of, uh, like, a, a guy killed, like, his girlfriend's parents, uh, allegedly. I think that case is still ongoing. I always like to throw allegedly out there. You know, they, they'd kind of gone defunct for a while, but the fact that you have, sh you know, splinter movements, um, the Fur Creek Division, um, and then, of course, the base being the most well-known today, uh, shows that it's not defined by one group of people because Iron March shut down as a forum several years ago when the individual who founded it just woke up one day and decided to shut everything down, right? Everything, you know, goes away. Um, but without Adam Waffen, without Iron March, 
uh, you have multiple splinter organizations that continue to form and reform and um, are talking on Telegram and stuff like that. They really have no noticeable overlap with any of the political organizations that that still exist or individuals that are putting out, um, you know, working within the system to some degree. Uh, but they're still here. So they're if it's not defined by you know James Mason, uh, his connection really to the movement seems to have been through Adam Waffen. So without Adam Waffen on the field. Uh, without Iron March as a network to discuss these ideas, they, they've already escaped containment, essentially. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, the Velociraptors have uh, have gotten out of their cage, uh, you know, like, so uh, there, there's not a whole lot you can do to, uh, to get them back in, it seems. So, I, I mean, I think it's it's going to be enduring because it, it goes beyond Adam Waffen. Like, Adam Waffen is no more. There is no, there is no Adam Waffen. Um, James Mason is, by all accounts, um, isolated in his apartment out there in Colorado somewhere. And um, these splinter groups keep forming. So mm-hmm. these ideas are going on. I mean, we, we, we saw pictures and stuff like that um, after the arrests of there being more members of the base in one place than I ever saw of Adam often in one place. Mm-hmm. So even without the, um, you know, kind of the, the center core of, of the originators of these ideas, without them there, they're, they're still continuing to grow and propagate in, um, you know, different underground networks. So I, I think it's going to continue for a long time, even, even without um, Adam Waffen and Iron March, the message of Siege, the message of uh, Charles Manson and of James Mason and of, of accelerationism is definitely still alive. And I, I don't, you know, want everyone to think, ah, oh, there's accelerationists behind every, <laughs> behind every mailbox, you know, underneath the, uh, you know, um, you know, every single manhole cover, but, but it is an issue. And, you know, they, they hate the, uh, the political white nationalists basically as much as they hate everyone. I mean, the Iron March had a, a leaflet that said uh, the alt-right is gay. And then uh, other, th- you know, other things that had a little bit more, more thinking to them uh, about executing members of the alt-right and stuff like that for being traitors, for not uh, accepting their, you know, apocalyptic uh, Mansonite fantasy. So this is something that is is going to continue. Is dangerous to basically everyone that isn't involved directly in the accelerationist thing. And as we can see with the murder of two Adam Waffen members by one of their former comrades, it's even dangerous to the individuals that are that are in it. <laughs> so I, I think uh, the message of uh, of James Mason is going to last uh, for for a lot longer than James Mason does, or his relevancy to one, any one individual group. Exactly. I, I think you hit that spot on. I, I, I also do want to reminisce on, you know, an c- important argument that was happening even in Adam Waffen's own forums where they were starting to identify the references and the constant references to Mason as like a Boomer Waffen component. And they had the whole Fission Waffen video, which was very well done, quite impressive, was taking place on Telegram almost simultaneously. It was almost like an exact replication of the migration of ISIS and jihadists off surface web into dark net during this period. And you had this whole like this contest amongst the youth who were really trying to implement a coup because they wanted to even go further than Mason in a typical fragmentation sort of splinter model that we see common in extremism. And I, I, I think it's only metastasizing further into the acceptable levels of wanton violence and the absolute non-reliance on anything that re- resembles, you know, saving the system as it is absolutely a destructive tendency. And Unfortunately, in the context of a post-COVID uncertainty with an economic downturn, increasing geopolitical fractures, and the re-election year, I agree, I think we'll probably see a big portion. And it probably will go in the same way that Al-Qaeda went from a hierarchical top-down organization to one that maintained itself by the dissemination of an ideology wherever its adherents in the world could you know, spew it. They were able to sort of decentralize themselves and become much more an ideological you know, movement, if you will, or even a brand that one could uh, adopt allegiance to almost anywhere in the world. And it started to impact people all over the world. And I think we're seeing some semblances of that with regard to the conversations around the transnationalization of the far right. When Mason broke up, Adam Waffen in that, you know, in that in that audio recording, he, he, he attributed it to breaking up for the common good, but really sort of clothed the breakup in a way where he was saying, you know, nobody's really renouncing anything. But we are renouncing formal organization, right? The formal structure. And I think it really was a call to like, hey, wink, wink, you know, this is just not wise. They're about to create domestic terrorist organization lists. So as long as you don't have allegiance to a particular organization, you can go ahead and continue to adopt the siege pill, 
call it whatever you want, probably better not to reference me, but now speaking and disbanding and almost leaving the future of the movement to, we might say, 13-year-old kids in Estonia, if you will. So when we talk about moving forward and when we talk about thinking about ways that we can heal or that we can sort of reverse these processes and prevent the, I think there is a likelihood of increasing terrorist attacks from this sort of ideological siege pill mentality. How would we go about thinking that through? How do we go about combating a enemy that is ideological that cannot be pinpoint because it calls itself Adam Waffen and adopts a flag or a telegram channel? How does that complicate resolving these issues? And, and, and if there is a way around that, how do we go about doing so in a way that's not counterproductive? Because- sure. Well, I mean, I feel like one of the biggest things that, that again, we see with combating this issue is, is not going directly at it, essentially. I mean, looking at how European countries and Arab countries have worked to combat um, Islamic extremism is a really important way of doing this. I mean, I think things like community engagement of individuals, I mean, first of all, across the board, but but that are potentially at risk to this and finding ways for them to be able to engage the system and not necessarily being a, a white nationalist organizer, but finding ways in their community to speak to their needs, whether it's housing, education, economic insecurity, loneliness, uh, getting proper mental health care. Uh, I think we need to go at the root of this issue and instead of trying to go right at it, because I mean, the thing is, if you, if you just try and go right at it, you, you just create martyrs. It's whether individuals are imprisoned or whether individuals are killed in shootouts or, or whatever, uh, that's just going to end up continuing a system where you, you have an endless stream of martyrs. I mean, you see amongst the uh, the siege-pilled individuals, everyone like Robert Bowers or Dylan Roof, uh, they call them saints, right? The idea that they that they are are holy individuals that are that are doing the Lord's work, even though, as we talked about in the past episode, uh, a lot of them are uh, big fans of Satanism. So I don't know, doing the devil's work. I know it sounds a bit nuts, but we're dealing with what we're dealing with. So I mean, to to just try and combat the problem directly is going to only force people more underground. It's going to create an increasing mythos of, of martyrdom and where individuals are going to be motivated to be martyrs themselves. So that's, I think, a, a horrible strategy, uh, absolutely terrible. Uh, that, that, that's going to make the problem worse. I think we need to be developing community programs to engage individuals that are viewed as at risk to help them feel fulfilled, to make them feel like they're part of the wider society, to be able to listen to their grievances and be able to find ways to help them. Because if we don't do that, then, I mean, why? I mean, we've been fighting the war on terror now for almost two decades. And, uh, you know, the United States and uh, continuing its losing tradition of imperialist conflicts, um, you know, has made peace with the Taliban and stuff like that. I mean, you know, the Islamic State might be gone as a physical entity, but it's still incredibly powerful around the world with the with the networks that have developed. And it's you, you can't just kill your way out of terrorism. Like, it, it doesn't work. Like, it has been tried and tried and tried and tried, and it, it, it just doesn't work. And it doesn't depend on what the ideology is. So I think inclusion, understanding and government and, and you know private entity support of individuals to help them not feel so hopeless and worthless and that the only thing that can be meaningful in their life is to become a martyr for uh, for Charles Manson you know like that's the way to solve the problem you can't arrest your way out of it you can't shoot your way out of it um, that's only going to embolden the fanatical individuals at the core of this and uh, increase the problem so I think engagement, love, and support, not to sound you know too hippy-dippy, but mm-hmm. that, that's the only way that I can see we can begin to really seriously combat this problem. And uh, that's a method that has seemed effective working in uh, community, you know, uh, poor Islamic communities in Europe and in uh, the Arab world, um, of actually reaching young people, especially young men, and giving them hope, making them part of the team, making them invested, and uh, making them care about their own lives. That seems to me the best strategy I just want to talk a little bit about the future, not just for our discussions, but for our society. We are uh, under a global pandemic, the likes of which we have never really had to deal with, and that have highlighted the interconnectivity of the uh, human race and the global populace. Um, We are also, as a consequence of that, um, slipping into an economic downturn that will leave with 
you know, all estimates probably not a very good economic scenario going forward. We have people retreating into more and more sort of protectionist economic policies. We still will reopen our societies in the global economy amidst a lot of fault lines for potential conflict, maybe the spark of a new Cold War, if you will, this time not just in reference to Russia there, but maybe even to China. And in so many ways, one can see the jihadists sitting back and laughing a bit, saying, look at how they waged a war on terror against us for 18 years, and now they're going to wage the very same war on terror against their own domestic populace, fighting their own far right wing extremist problem. And finally, we're going to get to sit back and watch them fall uh, and win this war of attrition that will create the void that we've been looking for. And I, and I can tell you that that's certainly how the long term Al Qaeda particularly, but ISIS strategists as well are viewing things and not to continuously go back and forth between the interrelationships between jihadism and the current manifestations of the extreme far right. But I think that accelerationism is an embodiment of what the jihadists wanted to lure us into with regard to this long-term war of attrition, or as Glenn Manning called it, <clears throat> you know, ble bleeding you to bankruptcy, if you will. And now, when we open these doors up again and we start to move around, not that you've stopped moving around, you're still working and, and moving around quite frequently, but um, when general society opens back up, we're also going to be faced with an election. And an election that is going to have serious implications for uh, how we move forward. Already, people on the left are, you know, preparing for an armed insurgency amongst Trump uh, from Trump uh, supporters in the event that he loses. The left is fragmented, with the far left factions of the Democratic Party unable to get their uh, support around Joe Biden. We have a lot of different fault lines. We have a lot of different problems going forward. And now we have these protests, which are now being conflated. The same thing is going on. These what you might call, you know, sort of conspiracy theorist militia slash white nationalists is now being portrayed as uh, sort of the more accelerationist strand. And inside of those movements, we have some evidence of individuals that have taken things recently into their own hands. When we come out of this towards the end of the year and once we get into a re-election, um, how is this going to, in your uh, thinking, how is this going to transform the movement and what can we expect uh, going forward under conditions of uncertainty uh, as we start to grapple and reopen up after this sort of shutdown and quarantine? Well, I mean, I think the impact on the movement in general is uh, all the above ground targets, uh, which are the opposite um, group of people I think the law enforcement should be focusing on. Uh, if there is this big outcry uh, against, you know, why aren't you, why aren't you doing something? We've got to do something. We, uh, I do see uh, repression of the above ground political movement um, happening, right? Because there's only uh, so many atom waffen cells that you can track down and things like that. And if there's this continual push, I mean, you, you can see how members of the Islamic community were treated post 9-11. And if there's that same sort of continual outcry about, you know, what are you doing about this? I, I can see more of a more more of a crackdown on people that are trying to engage the political system, which is going to only drive more recruits to the siege pilled individuals. And, and I think we'll probably at some point see see an uptick. I mean, add in the militias, which I mean, the militias, uh, there, there's a lot of multiracial militias. Uh, their ideology is, is not so much racial as it is a civic form of nationalism and patriotism. But uh, they, of course, you know, they're, they're, there is a risk that they can feel that their uh, their rights are, are being attacked and that they're not being represented. And, you know, really what that is, is you've got a bunch of working class guys for the most part, based on everything I've seen and read and heard, um, that are worried about their families, feeding their families, paying their mortgage, paying their rent, paying their car uh, bill and stuff like that, keeping gas in the tank. And, uh, you know, they're protesting to reopen because they're afraid for their families. It's economic insecurity. Uh, there's political instability and insecurity where people don't know uh, what's going to happen going forward. The disconnection, atomization of individuals from communities at large. So we, we've got a lot of a lot of moving pieces uh, with a lot of different factions of American politics. But, uh, yeah, I think the government's just going to keep being ham fisted against people that are are not dangers to the community you might not like their ideas but uh they're 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 not a a immediate or direct threat 
uh, but they're easier to catch because they're above ground and uh, that's going to happen and it's going to increase the ranks of uh, people that are that are more radical and you know as economic insecurity continues and people don't know if they're going to have a roof over their head I mean, we've got you know tens of millions out of work and stuff like that i think that'll make recruitment and most more important than recruitment but mobilization of individuals for direct action uh more likely because if you don't have anything to lose you know you might as well and uh yeah we're, we're in for a whole mess of a problem i think the economic downturn is only gonna increase fault lines fracture things more and uh we're gonna be we're gonna be busy when it comes to trying to uh, reduce violence and radicalization because people are gonna feel very desperate and uh, they have every right to feel very desperate. That's not that's not an illegitimate feeling. That's uh, you know, when you don't know if you can pay your rent or you don't have work or you applied for unemployment six weeks ago and you still haven't gotten your first check and your uh, you know, the your landlord's at the door and your kids are hungry, then uh, you have every reason to uh, want extreme changes and, and to be willing to listen to voices you might not have been willing to listen to before. So hopefully, uh, people will do the opposite of that and engage in building up communities, networking, providing economic and social support for um, working class people and marginalized individuals of all backgrounds. And we can cut this uh, problem off at the pass, but I'm, uh, I'm not incredibly hopeful looking at the American federal government's track record. I think uh, we uh, do have to contemplate how to, we might say, put the siege pill back in its bottle. Uh, so to say, and it's going to be very, very difficult to do, uh, particularly in the way that we're moving forward. We're going to continue uh, with these conversations. Do you know where you're going to take us next week? Well, I guess since I referenced it, uh, it might not hurt um, to to go ahead and read White Power uh, by Commander George Lincoln Rockwell, uh, because as I mentioned, that's probably one of the most read books uh, amongst the American far right. Going back to the 1960s, it really set up a lot of... Uh, I mean, the, the framework for a lot of the political minded organizations. And, you know, it would be nice to take a break from uh, blood sacrificing Satanism. Um, so <laughs> maybe we can scoot on over to the political side. But uh, yeah, I, th I think uh, White Power by Commander Rockwell might be our, our next book for next week. Very good. Well, thank you, Matt, again for, uh, for, for giving us your time. And we look forward to the next episode. Appreciate it.